Hey, Michael, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for joining me on Zoom today. I really appreciate your presence and time this morning, at least my time. I know your time is a little different in Germany. Uh, it certainly is. Uh, we're in uh, early evening here. Yeah, we had a little bit of a time zone mix up in the schedule, but I'm so grateful for your presence here today. So um, I typed up a little bit of topics ahead of time for us to talk about, and I'd just like to go through some of this stuff here with you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the depth of knowledge that you offer to the Reiki community um, so openly. And so let's just get to it. Um, your background is you're senior to the lineage uh, to me in the Hirai branch. Yeah. Um I got to study directly with uh, Sifu Christopher Matsuo and his direct lineage holder, Ray Carbolito. And uh, I, that's definitely where I got introduced to the, the share everything freely attitude of a teacher it was definitely with those two, Ray Carbolito and uh, Sifu Christopher Matsuo at the Shingon Temple in Honolulu. That's great. I trained with um, Tim White here in Tempe, Arizona. He's one of Chris's students from the 90s. Um, yep. And I had a really fortunate chance to do some private Yichuan training with Ray while he was visiting a couple of years ago. So I know Ray um, and he was really generous with his website. And um, I did the Hirai Master Practitioner course that he has on there. Super. Yeah, I, I really was super impressed by that. And, you know, seeing the stuff that you're sharing with Mikio out there, I, I decided to pursue your courses. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that and how that relates to our practices in our branch of Reiki. Well, the, the Mikio was taught right alongside the Reiki in the Shingon Temple. Um, Sifu Matsuo had, was of the opinion, and I uh, could totally, I totally agree with him, that the Reiki, it's a powerful, they are, they are powerful energies that are here to help humanity evolve. And when we go ahead and use it with Mikio, the Mikio grid is the centered projection of your cleared, activated, and focused energy from your core and when we project that out with the mikio grid that's all of us all of our, all of our being cleared energized and projected and then we when we put the reiki on top of that it makes it uh, so much more effective and uh, stronger it makes it it brings in uh, brings makes it more personal you have made it more personal with the Mikio. And that, that was, I, I agree with uh, Sifu Matsuo that the Mikio and the Reiki going together, they, it's like peanut butter <laughs> and bread. <laughs> They're just made for each other. Right, right. You know, I, I really have come to appreciate this practice in the last few years and knowing that I have a structure I can always rely on for my practice. You know, if I feel like, you know, what am I going to work on today? Well, you know, I could always just rely on Mikio and, and get those nine cuts in. <laughs> yeah. um, one thing that I wanted to bring up was uh, Kujikiri in a wider uh, esoteric context of Japanese Buddhism. So I've done a little bit of research into mm -hmm. some of the historical roots of it. And it looks like it descends from a Taoist practice called Ryojing Ryuja which um, summons six Yang generals and six Yin generals that are in the court of Vaishravana. Um, in Japan, uh, Vaishravana is called uh, Bishamon Ten or Tamon Ten. Um, so I was wondering if you had a little bit of um, information about that um, to clarify, like just how it kind of synthesized in Japan and how we got it. Well, the one thing I love about Japan is it became a melting pot of everything Asian. The, uh, the roots of the Mikyo go all the way back to Tibet. And so what, what we learned, what was shared with us in the Shingon Temple 
is the Japanese synthesis of all of these practices and the Shugendo Bergvolk and the, the people who lived up in the mountains, they would use Mikio for a different um, purpose than the Buddhist priests. Mm -hmm. But to directly answer your question, my experience with the Mikio energies is, is quite different than the one you just described. In the Shingon Temple, we were used, taught to use vortexes with the meditations, with the Mikio meditations. And I was out in, uh, after I moved to Hess, uh, to Germany, I was out in Hessen with some students. Uh, we were clearing a mat, the dark energy out of a mass grave there. And we did some meditations where the group went up into the vortex and there we found the Mikio energies as balls of different colored light in each one had their own place in the circle around us. And at that point, that, that's the way my practical experience has been with the energies of the Mikio, mm. getting to know them personally um, that way. I see. Thank you for that sharing experience. Um, you know, I've seen a few Tigles, I believe they're called in Tibet, the orbs um, in practice. And um, I was visited by a dragon once. That was... <laughs> <laughs> That was intense. <laughs> they uh, wrapped me up and I felt like I was being squished by a boa constrictor. It was, it was pretty crazy, but uh, I didn't really have any issues with migraines after that. That was great. Um, can't complain, right? <laughs> so um, in your practice in Europe, you're taking your students to places where extreme trauma has happened. Um, Holocaust um, camp, uh, concentration camps and that sort of thing. Uh, would you care to share a little bit about how you guys are applying your Mikio energies and these vortices that you just described it to help heal the land in Europe? Well, I uh, was back in uh, 2015, I was teaching Mikio at a place called Spirit Berlin. Uh, it was a, a beautiful place, a uh, penthouse of a building, and they had beautiful wide rooms with lots of light. It was a great place to teach. And the first class I had, we went through the three steps that I was teaching. First level Mikyo, where we clean and energize our own meridians using the Reiki or the Mikyo mudras and mantras. And then the second Part where we start uh, clearing the dark energies out of living spaces like apartments and houses. And uh, I've, we've even cleared commercial buildings. And the third step being pulling energies out of other people. So once we finished the three steps, I thought, well, okay, I'm done here. <laughs> <laughs> the students were like, no, 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 wait a minute. This is a great idea. Uh, let's take it out and use it. And I was like, well, good. I guess I'm with you. Let's go. <laughs> right. And at their uh, urging, we went up to uh, a place north of Berlin. Um, there's a memorial there in a mass grave where 7,000 Germans were murdered after the war was already over. If you can imagine some, uh, surviving something as horrible as World War II and you're like, thank God that's over. And then the Russians come in and go, uh, not for you. And so any, that's how the 7,000 Germans ended up getting murdered and dumped in a mass grave. And we used the Mikio to collect all the soul fragments and darkness and just misery out of the area, all those dark feelings and energies and we have noticed here in Europe that the, the energies are attached more strongly and for longer periods of time where the blood is spilled right into the dirt, right in the earth. Those places hold the trauma longer. 
so we use the Mikio grid to collect every all the all those dark energies into one place. We actually use the monument stone they put there in memorial of the 7,000 murdered Germans. And uh, we cut the Mikio grid on it, sent that uh, darkness to the light, and then we cut another larger Mikio grid and started and proceeded to pour Reiki, healing Reiki energies into the, the land right there to help clear that, that bad feeling. And I found it particularly interesting. Um, my students were all from Germany and it had the effect, what we did that day, of not only helping nature do its, nature run its course and help move these energies out so that they can begin, they can continue their evolution. When that dark energy is stuck here, it, 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 it does influence the people around it. It's not moving on to evolve mm -hmm. as it should, as we all should. Right. It just stays stuck. So when we move that energy to the light, we're doing it a huge favor so it can continue its evolution and leave us in, in peace with a, a lighter, more natural vibe to the land. But what I found most interesting was the the German nationals that were with me and uh, were my students, are my students, um, had never even conceived that such a thing could be possible. And I was like, oh yeah, we do this all the time in Hawaii. It's, <laughs> what, we're clearing the land? Well, it must be Tuesday. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's go do some sand gel. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, so that is one thing I did want to bring up was um, Reiki in the United States has a lot of different influences. And so our line is very rich with uh, Chinese alchemical practices like Qigong, uh, Bagua Chong, the martial art, as well as, um, you know, Mikio and, and other influences. So for the most part here in the United States, people have learned from one student or another of Takata Hawaii. Um, would you like to expound on that a little bit? I would. Um, I have a huge amount of respect for um, Takata Sensei. Um, she went to go get healed in Japan. And um, I would imagine that Usui Sensei um, and uh, Hayashi Sensei, they were pretty evolved Japanese men, I would guess. Mm -hmm. I'm old, but I'm not old enough to have known them. But I would <laughs> guess they were pretty evolved. <clears throat> but even given that, I wouldn't say it was a misogistic mis 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 attitude, but women were just seen as, uh, mm, yeah, oh, is she really worthy to carry on the tradition? Hmm, I'm not sure. I think it must have been very difficult for her um, in some accounts that I read, she, she just kept trying and trying and this, please, can I, would you give me the teachings so I could pass it on? And she was persistent and I respect that. And um, she got uh, the teachings passed on to her and she was, um, I think the one who began with structuring it. So the, the raw energies are nature energies. They're part of our natural universe. And then humans are like, well, to help humans get their brain around this, maybe we need to structure it. And I appreciate her, her structuring. And I would also encourage students of Reiki to know that these energies, they're, I don't, I don't want anyone to take it the wrong way if I say they're like house pets, but they will come if you call. And they love to be with you and they love <laughs> to play with you. So don't, don't ever lose that. You, right. you keep the structure, but, but keep the playfulness, keep the, yes, we want to be here to help your patients overcome their issues. They want us to get to evolve. Yes, I, I have noticed that, you know, the energies will bring what it is you need. One of my, um, 
my actually my only level three student right now, um, he is adopted and he has found a great sense of family with the ancestral lineage guides from receiving these attunements. They, they come and he's very spiritually aware with his vision. And, you know, he's able to see these spirit guides as they arrive to help him. And he's like, oh, it's like I have a whole family. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's what <laughs> yes, a lineage is. <laughs> yes, yes, you do. Yes, you do. So I, I don't want anyone to take it the wrong way by um, saying they might be like house pets, but they, they are friendly, they love you, and they will come when you call. But getting back to uh, Takata Sensei, I, I have a lot of respect for her um, being a woman leading in bringing this healing to Hawaii and to the, then to the world, to the right. U.S. I have a lot of respect for her, her for that. I do too. I can only imagine the challenges that she faced as a Japanese woman after World War II, trying to provide an alternative wellness practice to Americans. <laughs> that, that must have been yeah. such an incredible challenge. Um, you know, I cannot blame her for trying to present some of this information in a way that these people can grasp more readily. Um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I didn't really have any knowledge of Reiki before I started class. So I, I came into it completely ignorant. I can't imagine, you know, somebody in 1950 coming to learn Reiki, you know, like that must have been a challenge for her to gain yeah. students. Well, I, I agree. Yeah, it must have been. And, and she persevered and she succeeded. And she was one of the uh, people who gave attunements to Christopher Sifu Matsuo. He also got uh, attunements from um, Hide Mitsuoka, Mitsuoka Sensei. So Chris was, he was and remains a dedicated pursuer of the pure truth. And uh, that's one of the many reasons I respect and uh, value and treasure the time I was able to spend studying with him. Yeah, you know, Chris is, is really a scholar of all of this stuff. Um, years ago, when I was studying Chen style Tai Chi, I had a friend that was um, doing distance work with Chris's material for Bhagavad And, you know, he's just in love with Chris as a person and, you know, how much he received benefit from the practices. And one of the things that I've found time and again is these things that, that Chris just kind of throws out there offhand, like these little nuggets of gold, you know, just little bits of information like, oh, I'm going to go Google that now. And, you know, next thing, you know, I'm trying to uh, research this whole branch of, of Rei Jutsu called Joe Rei, you know, so um, that's something I wanted to mention a moment ago um, with Takata Hawaii. Um, there were a few of her students that were related to her, like Phyllis Furumoto and Irish Kuro, who, you know, pursued things like Joe Ray. Also, the Jikiden branch of Reiki um, from Yamaguchi Chiyoko. It's said that Yamaguchi Chiyoko studied Joe Ray as well. So I feel like there's a lot of um, interplay between these two arts of energy healing. And even the, the great bright light symbol, Daikomio, is, is pretty much the same between the two so I was wondering if you had anything to add. In uh, studying the different um, different types of Reiki, uh, it it did occur to me, and I did notice um, that the energies on many of them are are, are so similar. Uh, when I was t learning Hawaiian chant from Kumu Alva. She taught us this technique of uh, chanting into mango trees. And from this technique of chanting into mango trees, the first time you chant in, you inhale the chant back. And the first time you, you've, you get this really grounded feeling like, whoa, my roots are just down in the earth. I'm so grounded. And the next chant in, inhale it back. And then you feel like so upright, like the tree. And then you chant the third time and you feel this waving in the breeze feeling that the branches have as the wheat, as the breeze blows in Hawaii. Now, how this has to do with your question, 
The fourth step is where you just close your eyes and energetically enter into what you're chanting to. And you find yourself in, inside the tree and the tree is very welcoming and you kind of check out its energy and you get a real sense of what that, what it's like to be the tree, especially after the three chants where you've extended from its roots to its crown and you're in it, you've chanted yourself into it, you really feel what that's about. And I took this teaching of hers into the Mikyo. For example, when we were up with the energies of the Mikyo in the vortex, we, I instructed the students and I also entered into the individual energies. Now, as I've done this with the Reiki energies, and in comparing the two schools you just mentioned, they, the symbols look a little same, but the flavor and the feeling and the, you get a sense of their duty almost. Their, it's not duty in, indicates something a little, oh, I have to do this, but it, it's kind of like what I'm here to help you accomplish feeling of the Reiki mm. is, is between the schools on some of the symbols you mentioned, particularly, it's, it's so close that it might just be a, an artist's interpretation in the sign right? right? as the difference. But the energies, yeah. Thank you. Um, so here in the West, we have a few innovations of Reiki. Um, you know, William Rand is is very well known for popularizing uh, Usui Tibetan Reiki from Arthur Robertson that he helped develop. Um, then um, later on, there was Tara Mai and Karuna. And um, now there are some newer developments, like um, he teaches a style called Holy Fire uh, that uses Jesus as the guru. And I personally am um, certified under Brett Bevel for psychic Reiki, um, for Usui Macau's psychic Reiki crystal. So it's basically like a Reiki Ling Bao uh, <laughs> that he distributes via the internet. I, I really enjoy that. Um, but I was wondering if you had um, some things you would like to share about your experience with these uh, innovations like Tibetan and Karuna Reiki and what you feel those add to the traditional practices? Well, my experience with the, the Tibetan Reiki was it's a, it's a little raw, a little more like beginning of life on earth <laughs> era. Um, raw. So primordial sort of? A little primordial. Thank you. Okay. That's, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah, a little primordial. The... Usui, what the energies he encountered in his visit to the Mikio temple on uh, was it Mount Kurama, they're, they're a lighter, more like they were, they were from higher up on the mountain, or they have a, a, a little higher, a little finer feel to them, to me, mm -hmm. uh, than the, the Tibetan Reiki. The Tibetan Reiki is a little more... Uh, if you want to compare, the Sui Reiki would be more like Bagua, nice fluid motions, spinning and turning, and the Tibetans more like Tsingyi, <laughs> more direct. That, that's how it seems to me. Right, right. I, I like that analogy. I'm, I'm actually uh, a Xingyi guy that got into Bagua, so... Um... Perfectly suited. You right. <laughs> I, I love Xing Yi Qian as a practice, and I teach um, Neigong from Xing Yi. Actually, I'm about to do that in a little while this morning um, for my students at the local park. Um, here, I got into the Dragon Gate Sanctuary Baguazhang through uh, another Baguazhang school, um, and my elder Gong Fu brother had gone to learn from Chris and Ray in Hawaii, and um, I got a chance to learn from Tim White when he opened up some teachings. And that was that was really incredible, Nei Gong. Um, I still basically do the same martial arts side of the other style, but I've, I've tried to integrate as much as I can of the Dragon Gate Sanctuary physical practices. Um, so that was one thing I wanted to bring up was 
you know, Hidetoshi Mitsuoka is, is a really talented martial artist and he preserves a number of practices. <laughs> I mean, wow. Yes, yes he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> and could you describe some of your experiences with Hide in training with him? Uh, yes, actually I can. I, uh, uh, Ray used to tease me because I was always taking notes and uh, I was, he goes, yeah, just, just get it in your muscle memory. Just forget the notes. But I was always taking notes. I was always behind the camera. Um, and one day I was behind the camera and Hide Sensei had just finished like about a 20 minute cloud hands exercise. And he goes, okay, now we're going to do the other side. And we did the other side for about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And one of the students goes, um, what, sensei, sensei, what's, what's the point of cloud hands? And uh, I was behind the camera <laughs> and I went, why don't you show him? <laughs> why don't you show him? And uh, he goes, yeah, okay, coming up here, Butch. So Butch goes up there. And he's got his flip-flops on and it's a nice warm summer day in the Shingon temple. And uh, Hide says, uh, okay, I'm going to show you what the benefit of the cloud hands are. Now, um, you two, yes, get up there and, and you catch him. And there he goes, no, 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 a little further back. And we're like, come on. <laughs> and, he goes, and he goes, okay, now, <clears throat> are you ready, Butch? Butch goes, ready for what? And he did his Bruce Lee one inch. He just dropped his palms like that. And because he had just spent half an hour pulling the energy up from the earth, he just went bap. And the two people that were supposed to catch him just went, <laughs> as, he went between them, as he went between them. And he says, I told you to catch him. And <laughs> Chris directed a couple of the Reiki masters we had in class over to make sure he was all right. He was fine. And his, his flip-flops stayed in the same place. So he got <laughs> blasted right out of his flip-flops. And that's, that was uh, Hide Sensei. Yeah, Hide Mitsuoka Sensei. Another time, he, uh, I got, a, I got uh, my first Reiki transmission from him. And I think he was in, he had spent the morning doing his private practice. And then he came in to give us all transmissions. And um, Matt, that was so strong that all I could do for like the next half hour was just sit in a corner in the temple and just let it process in. And I was, I had, was weeping and it was just like clearing everything out. And it was uh, one of the most powerful spiritual experiences of my uh, time there at the Shingon Temple. And uh, so his, his transmissions were very much the real deal. And later in life, when I went to, I moved to Japan for a couple of years. And I uh, told Chris before I went, hey, I think I'll just drop in and go see uh, uh, Hide uh, Mitsuoka Sensei. And he goes, hmm, really? Did he invite you? And I went, uh, no, you know, I just think I'd drop in, you know, I'll just drop in and say hello. He goes, you know that his dojo is kind of like the tiger's den. He, he's got, he just teaches black belts. That's it. Yeah. So. Okay, well, what do you think might happen if you weren't invited? Uh, and then, then that was it. He's so zen. He's so zen. So he let me finish the sentence. Oh, hmm. His black belts might think, oh, these are the guys that you left us for for a couple months that summer to go teach them Reiki and stuff. And, well, let's see how good they are on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> let's test their metal. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's test this uh this guy from hawaii let's see how good he is and i thought hmm so my mind filled in all the 
missing uh, words. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just send him a postcard. Because, <laughs> yeah, his life in Japan was, he, he is this, the, the warrior priest. His, his whole dojo, according to what Chris has shared with us, is, is he doesn't talk to them unless they're black belts. As they, they wouldn't be able to understand what he's sharing properly. And I, when, um, when, well, when the teachers get that high, yeah. I mean, he can, he can break it down, but it's, uh, it's always a trip I wanted to make. Maybe someday I'll get an invitation and I'll go. That for me would be like a, a real treat. But, right. Uh, I, I don't know if you've um, been able to read any of his writing. I, I looked at a Google translate of one of his books one time and it just, it wasn't sufficiently well translated for me to understand, um, you know, but e even getting the gist of what the translation was, um, you know, Mitsuoka Sensei's writing, you, yeah, you're right. You have to be a black belt of some style or another to even approach what it is he's trying to talk about because he's talking about like illusory bodies and a physical body and perception of yourself and all this other stuff that if you don't have at least a decade <laughs> you're not going to be able to even um think about what he's talking about it's just not there with you yet uh, there is there is one thing that i learned to appreciate with the classes from uh, sifu matsuo as We'd go through his uh, course. He, he would always teach something new. And we took some things in bite-sized chunks one week at a time. Uh, so we might spend like a month on one item uh, before we moved on. And after about, I'd say 18 months, we went back and started at the beginning. But the second time I entered into that topic, I was able to see more, understand more, and assimilate more. So I think that's, that's what I wanted to say with uh, Mitsuoka Sensei's dojo. If I just went in there like, la, 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 here I am, don't really know much about your black belt, uh, that the uh, style you're teaching here in Japan, because he, he was not teaching that style in Hawaii. Okay that I would not have been able to appreciate what he was sharing. Was he and teaching um, Han Shiichuan back then or, or was it a Japanese art? I think, I think he was in his dojo. I think he was in the Japanese, his uh, Japanese roots. Okay. I believe so. Because I know he's so incredibly talented. He's a, a <laughs> certified representative of a number of arts. So, you know, what he chooses to teach is, yeah. uh, you know, always the question, right? <laughs> um, I've, I've really come to appreciate the richness of, um, you know, just some of the stuff that Chris and Ray have shared through the years and, you know, just thinking about what Hide has, you know, that must be incredible. Uh, <laughs> Mitsuoka Sensei is just um, really impressive to me after my experience with the Han family group in Sacramento. I got to um, meet up with Nick Domich, and he's a student of um, Henry Lux. So Henry mm -hmm. Lux studied with, uh, uh, what was the fellow's name? Uh, Guo Lin Ying in uh, San Francisco. And then he went to, I believe, Hong Kong and studied with Han Xing Yuan. Um, and so then, I believe they helped uh, Yu Peng Shi come to the United States as well. So he got three different first generation students of Hong Chong Zai as his teacher um, for Yi Chan. So then he passed on his knowledge in Northern California. And now um, the Sacramento group is under Han Jing Chen, who is uh, Hide Sensei's, uh, Sensei Mitsuoka's um, teacher in Han Shi Yi Chan now. So, um, you know, it's, it's been interesting seeing kind of the dichotomy of the styles because the, the more modern Yi Chan is, is much softer. It's much softer. The Han, the Han Xing Chao versus the, the more Han Xing Wan practice. It's, it's a completely night and day thing. <laughs> I don't know if you've gotten to experience that dichotomy in the two brothers, um, lineage. 
Mm, not personally, no. Okay. Yeah. But it, I find it interesting that you share. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I've been, I've been, um, you know, really grateful and fortunate to have met Nick Domich and, you know, seen some of these people on the internet share what they have, you know, and being able to see what these training materials are like on this side and that side. It's like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. This is one's just a straight bruiser and the other is like more of a, an energetic. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, that Shingy versus Bagua mentality uh, that you mentioned earlier, and um, you know it was it was said Han Xinguan was was a a mob enforcer in Shanghai. So uh, <laughs> that that may well be true. I don't know. Um, so all of this this like samurai inheritance that Mitsuoka Sensei has is is what enabled him to access the Hirai teachings in Shingon Temple. Is that correct? Well, I don't know exactly uh, what his access was, but um, he definitely, I mean, he was teaching me things about the, the way that a gi is cut as and he, he was observing that men in Japan had forgotten how to walk. Because mm. in the old days when you walked, it literally brought the gi tighter around you because you, you, they were moving from their core and that uh, during World War II with marching and they completely, um, well, the, the military lost respect for, well, not lost, let me see what I want to say here. They, they weren't carrying through into militarization of the Japanese man, the traditions of the samurai. They kept, they kept the sword, but they lost things like the way they walk. He literally showed me one day, here, yeah, watch out what happens with my gi. And it was, as he walked, it was just kind of like tightening around him because of the way that he was moving from his core. And so his roots in the Japanese traditions go, go very deep. And, but I'm not really sure what his access was okay. in that instance you mentioned. All right. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so... One of the things that I keep seeing is people don't really have a very good understanding of kind of how the Taoist alchemy side fits into Reiki because there is that Onmyoto Taoist influence in a lot of the underlying theory. Um, Usui Sensei focused on the three Dantians, which is straight out of Chinese alchemy. Um, and then it said that Hayashi Sensei is the one that brought in the 12 organ meridians and the chakras practices into the practice. So, um, you know, when a lot of people get into researching, you know, Jing, they might find something from Mantak Chia and, you know, they got to hold their Jing in for a hundred days and, you know, all of this other stuff. And honestly, I feel like much of this is, is kind of, for the wrong audience right so if you're in a temple that's a very appropriate practice but if you're married you know it's it's a different thing right like yeah it's a different world yeah and so i feel like for most of us who are lay practitioners out in the world um you know just regulating your habits and your diet and then you know maybe an uh, accessory exercise like tibetan five rites will be more than sufficient to keep your jing in, in a good place well i i think um the benefits um or easy ways to keep the jing, jing in place um for the tibetan the five tibetan rites you mentioned um what I find effective is a 108 sun salutations in the morning. It only takes 20 minutes. And what that's doing is it runs the energy through all the meridians and you're getting <clears throat> from males, you get a real good work on the, the pelvic floor. So you're, extra, you're massaging and expanding and contracting the internal organs, the prostate, the um, I'm thinking in German now, I've been here so long, the dickdarm and the dundarm. <laughs> The large intestine and the small intestine so uh, it keeps everything healthy and flexed and moving and contract it moves the blood um something simple like that i think obliviates the need for uh enforced celibacy in a world where it's we're yeah we're not living in a temple we're living right. in the world 
Right. And, and so that's something that we always have to keep in mind is like, what does our life actually entail? You know, I'm a dad. I don't know about you. I've got a little boy running around. You know, there's, I can't have sharp blades. I got, you know, these, these nice dull practice blades, <laughs> and, um, you know, my kid, he loves them. So it, it's, it is what it is. Right. <laughs> and, um, one thing I wanted to bring up was you focus a lot on the Sanjiao exercise and that has so many different applications to your health. You can use it to link your three Dantians. You can use it to purify your central channel. You can use it to, you know, link up your five elements in the middle Dantian. There's so many different ways you can work with that exercise. And one of the innovations I noticed in your videos was that you started to integrate some of the mudras from the Mikio into the Sanjiao Qigong. Well, we, the Sanjiao, when, for example, when we're going to clear the land, we, we start off with uh, some Bagua circle walking, then some Sanjiao, and then we get around to, to cutting grids. So, but the Sanjiao, one of the very interesting thing about Sanjiao that I um, that came to my attention during the Corona lockdowns was we don't really have a tool that you can go out and buy like a voltmeter that will give you the ac you have an electric light somewhere you can get the accurate reading mm -hmm. of how many volts it's drawing or how many volts it's taking. We don't have anything accurate like that to measure the bodily your energy body yet and when i noticed was i was doing some uh, classes at the gapa zoe which was a like a weekend festival we had here that got shut down by the corona uh, pandemic and in those sessions i'd have everybody use a pendulum and just there is no wrong answer. Just where's your energy right now before we get started? And let's say they had a 20 on the scale. Then we do the circle walking and we do the sanja when we pull in energy. And at the end, we'd have them measure it again. And it would be at least 50% more than when they started. Uh, this was consistent. This was something you could Anybody could do it. Everyone had a different baseline. But when they were done with San Zhao and the energy movement of Bagua, it would always increase, at least by 50%. During the pandemic, when I didn't have, I wasn't, I didn't have classes to teach. They're like, no classes. I got into like, well, okay, well, let's, let's, let's see what we can do with this. And like the Reiki energy. When you call, they must come. You can dial in how much energy you're taking in. Being consistent with it. Now that takes practice. So for the Sanjiao, at a certain point, I felt like the energy started teaching me how it wanted to be brought in, which um, I, would, I would suggest and encourage students to try on their own. There's, there's no better teacher than your own experience. I agree with that. You know, I've been taught two different versions of Sanjiao now in person from two different lines that are related to each other for uh, like the Xingyi side and the Bagua side. And um, one is just a little bit simpler than the other. You know, it was it was kind of like a simplification of the one that, that Chris and Ray teach, you know. Um, so Speaking about Bagua circle walking, the eight energy set works on the same meridians as the Mikio mudras, correct? You can kind of use the eight energy set for a similar function to cultivate energy in those spaces. Uh, yes. So okay. <clears throat> walking the eight energy set um, will run the, the energy through those in the same progression. That's those, they, they um, complement each other very well. Now, um, 
there are some aspects of Chinese medicine that don't translate directly, like the five elements. I, I think I almost broke my brain trying to get that to fit into Mikio, and it just doesn't. And, and that's, a, that's okay. That's okay. We have to be okay with that being okay, that it just doesn't fit. Right. But um, I, I found that you're, you are correct, and those energies, they uh, progress up the body, and uh, I can feel the same meridians running as when you're doing the Kujikiri. Yeah, I, I started working with some of the um, sacred geometry visualizations when I started circle walking that you had um, introduced in the Udemy courses that you so generously created. Thank you. Um, so, you know, when I'm doing the hands on water, I'll have a red cube in my root chakra and, and, and so forth. Um, I found that to be a really interesting alchemical practice to, to kind of put the two together. Oh, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, so speaking of really interesting alchemical practices, the Your Inner Light course, you share um, some toning and um, three basic circle walking postures to help you empower ob uh, objects and water and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I just wanted to share with you when I was practicing that course, my son, who was about two at the time, you know, I, I came in the house from circle walking in the backyard and he says, daddy, I was like, what's up, bud? He has fire and he says not to be afraid. And he says his name is Ariel and we can cut him. I was like, okay, <laughs> tell me more about what Ariel says. Ariel says to be good. Bye. <laughs> and, you know, I started looking up the Ariel is is the other side of Yaldabaoth's name. So it's Ariel Yaldabaoth. And, um, you know, so I started working with the letters R-E-L instead of I-A-O. And I found that change has really like upped my practice. Um, yeah. Just because that's the name that they came to tell us, right? Like the, I'm Ariel, they didn't say I'm Yaldabaoth. So, you know, I, I, I made a switch to the different letters. I thought, um, you know, that might be something you were interested in hearing. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> children are amazing. They're, they're nearer the source. And I think the source finds them easier to, to contact. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting because he was so playful about it, but I've never <laughs> seen him that still before, right? Like, a, it's like, you're dead still. What's up, buddy? <laughs> oh, there's an archangel in the house. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, the go ahead. Oh, I was just saying it's it's been an incredible journey, and I, I really wanted to thank you so much for everything that you shared with the world. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thanks for the appreciation. So I would like to to take that or go on that cue and uh observe how many times um, that we've been walking circle. And this started with Chris in Kapiolani Park in Honolulu, when we used to do sessions in the park there. And as the group walked the circle, if it was overcast, there'd be a hole in the clouds above the Bagua circle. And I noticed that and I went, is there something to that, Chris? He goes, yeah, it happens all the time. Just You'll get used to it. <laughs> I was like, okay. And we were doing a clearing for the government building just December 10th. And this the same phenomenon happened as we were doing like an energetic clearing. They had a new government coming in. I went down there to just do a clearing, just okay. You guys deserve a clean plate. So let's get all the old energy out of here and just make a nice welcome. And by the time uh, we finished, there was this nice hole. And if there's anything Berlin has in winter, it's dark, flat, gray skies. But right over the building, this nice little hole, and the sun was coming through. That's incredible. Yeah. Happens all the time. Right? I, I have had similar experiences myself. Um, when I first started training with Tim White, he gave us the Vajra transmission first before we did the Reiki class. 
And one day I just went to the park and I started practicing and the wind blowing and clouds moving. And I'm just like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I get text messages. Who's practicing? It's me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so it, it's, it's been a, a really interesting experience. And I feel like Reiki just feeds right back into that Vajra transmission um, as far as, uh, at least for me, the weather work that I do, I feel like I can, I can more effectively use Reiki symbols to channel my intent for that purpose. Cause you know, I'm in a desert and rain's good. So, <laughs> uh, right. but you know, I've, I've applied myself a little bit in the last summer we had record rains. Um, it didn't quite cure the drought, but you know, we get summer rain more than winter rain here in, in Arizona. So um it, it's expected that we have a drought in the desert right <laughs> no one's surprised right well uh michael i have to get down the path to the park and teach qigong here good well before we uh close i'd like to uh, make an offer to your listeners um i'm gonna post a video tomorrow the hero's journey okay on my uh website so just so we can uh, put a timestamp on that, today is the 22nd of January, 2022. So tomorrow. It'll be up. And if the first five listeners who can tell me who taught me cranial sacral therapy will get a free access to the Udemy class. And I can put that right in the chat box. Little chat box. And I'll put that right in the chat box, um, send you that, and you can put it in the, the description. Okay, the, great. So the first one, five who can email me and tell me who taught me uh, cranial sacral therapy, get free access to the Udemy Mikio One class. Well, so who did to... teach you cranial sacral? Is that something we have to find on your website? Uh, it's in the video it's in the okay. hero's journey it's in the hero's, hero's journey. journey okay i just want to make sure that we are looking in the right place yep and that's be... going to be on your youtube yes it will great great i will um get this to my friend who edits my videos and and audio stuff uh hopefully they're not too busy they are a professor at the local uh, university so um Excellent. I just really wanted to thank you again for your time and, and all of the information. And I got to go teach some people how to roll a ball. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell them it's got real valuable application in the, in the real world. That's right. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here at Syncretic Qigong and Reiki. And thank you, in Matt. the future, Michael, I hope to uh, have a sit down with you and um, you know, really get through some, some deeper topics and, um, you know, maybe have some Q and a stuff for, you know, maybe my students might have some questions on the Mikio cause I do have some people working on that now. So, um, I look forward to it. all right. Have a great night. You too, Matt. Thank you very much. Sarah Mangalam. Okay.